and this evening we're going to talk about the hypothalamus and metabolism. Um, it's quite a big lecture um, because as I'm sure you'll know from preclinical, the hypothalamus covers quite a lot of different things um, and so we're not going to cover all of it this evening um, but we're going to go through the main things, the function of the hypothalamus, um, look at the endocrine and the autonomic nervous systems, have a little dip into growth um, and then finally finish up with some appetite regulation. Um, so the learning objectives are from your syllabus and they're massive um, because like I said it's a really big topic so I've kind of dialed it down to four main things um, so what the functions of the hypothalamus are and I think the main two are the control of the endocrine and the autonomic nervous systems the stress response which again is all coordinated by the hypothalamus metabolism and growth which is a bit of a divergence, but again, we'll see the same themes um, of hypothalamic hormones involved. And then finally, appetite control. So we're going to start by having a general look at the hypothalamus. Um, firstly, looking at the anatomy of it, um, its role in homeostasis, and then um, its output system. So to position ourselves, um, the hypothalamus is at the base of the forebrain. Um, and as its name suggests, it's just below the thalamus. Um, anatomically, it makes up the floor and the ventral walls of the third ventricle of the brain. And despite only being 1% of the brain volume, um, it actually has a massive impact on the body. Um, as you can see from this diagram, there are quite a lot of nuclei. Um, and I don't expect you to go away and learn all of them, but I think there are a few main ones that are probably worth knowing. Um, and I think if you split them into three groups, it's quite useful. So you've got the first, the anterior region, which is the one you can see in green. Um, and this has got the supraoptic and the paraventricular nuclei. And these are the ones that project to the posterior pituitary and produce ADH and oxytocin. The ones in the middle are the tuberal region. And this is where the pituitary stalk comes off. And here you'll find the ventromedial and the arcuate nucleus. And we'll talk about these a little bit more later um, when we look at appetite control. And then finally, in red, you can see the posterior region, which has the mammillary bodies, which are part of the papez circuit and important in memory, and the posterior nucleus, um, which is also important for body temperature. Um, so like I said, there are lots of different nuclei, um, but I'd say these are some of the main ones um, that you need to know. And they've all got lots of different functions, um, and I just made the table myself, and I think it's probably most of the ones that you need to know for the exam. Um, these areas are not exact. There are more areas involved in satiety, say, than the ventromedial nucleus. Um, but if you wanted a generic overview of what the functions of each of them are, I'd say that's a pretty good one to start. Um, and just a quick note on the pre-optic nucleus, um, which you can see in green because it's part of the anterior region. Um, we're not going to talk about it a lot here, but it's actually a really important and interesting one um, because it's also known as the sexually dimorphic nucleus um, because it's different in males and females. And that shows us it's got a really important role in puberty, uh, which is why it's involved in GnRH release. So. What is the function of the hypothalamus? Um, I'm sure you all know by now the definition of homeostasis, um, which is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And I think that's the simplest definition of it. Um, and the hypothalamus is all about homeostasis. So how does it do this? It's a bit like a computer operating system. So it receives various inputs from body sensors about different parameters. So temperature, osmolality, things like that. It has a comparator comparing the current value to what the set point should be for the body. And then via its outputs, it corrects any deviation um, from the set point. So output, comparator, input, output, comparator, output. So to monitor body conditions, it has to have inputs from different sensors around the body. So there are many. So you've got the limbic system, um, and this is particularly involved with the mammillary bodies in the hypothalamus, um, and they're important in memory. So it's got inputs from the fornix, um, which transmits signals from places like the hippocampus. You've got olfactory receptors, um, which are important because, of course, the hypothalamus is involved in appetite control. Um, so it needs input from what the environment is um, of food. Um, the SFO and the OVLT, which are quite a mouthful, um, which are the subfornical and the organum vasculosum of the 
lamina terminalis. Um, and so these are what are known as circumventricular organs. So they are outside the blood brain barrier, which means they can monitor the osmolality of um, the, the circulation. Um, so these are important for osmolality homeostasis and ADH release, um, as we'll talk about a bit later. You've got cutaneous sensors involved in temperature sensing, the retina and the suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, which is involved in the internal body clock. And then the nucleus tractus solitaris, um, which is involved in lots of visceral sensory information. So things like the vagus on what the blood pressure is, gut distension on the respiratory rate. And yes, yeah, so there's a lot of inputs to the hypothalamus, basically. Um, and just, again, highlights its really important role in body homeostasis. Um, and along the bottom, you can see, as well as having lots of inputs from receptors, the hypothalamus also has some intrinsic receptors of its own. So we'll see a bit later, it's got its own thermoreceptors and osmoreceptors, um, and it also has nutrient and hormonal receptors. So those are the main inputs to the hypothalamus. And so how does the hypothalamus, having detected a change, so a, a deviation from homeostasis, how does it then correct it? Well, that's what we're going to spend the next bit of the lecture looking at. So there are two main outputs of the hypothalamus, and these are the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. And via these two main things, the hypothalamus is able to control pretty much all body functions. And we're now going to take a closer look but first, if you want to flip over to Socrative, um, there are a couple of questions um, to go through. And I forgot to say at the start, but if you've got any questions throughout, um, I'm happy to monitor the chat or we'll have a chat afterwards um, if you just want to put some questions there and we'll do that. Great. I think we'll go through the results of that. So well done. 100% super optic and paraventricular. Brilliant. Well done, guys. Um, and then finally, where does the pituitary gland lie below? This will be an interesting one that we'll come on to a little bit more later. Yep. So in terms of where does it lie below, you've got the hypothalamus, then you've got the pituitary gland. And what the answer I was after is the optic chiasm. So well done to you guys who got that. Um, and we're going to come on to that now as we talk about the endocrine system. So this is to do with the intimate relationship between the hypothalamus, which lies above the pituitary gland. So this diagram is tiny, but I thought it's a really good summary of all the different functions of the pituitary gland. So I've put the reference at the bottom um, if you want to look that up afterwards and find a bigger version. So the hypothalamus controls the two parts of the pituitary, which are the anterior and the posterior pituitary. And it does this through two different functions. So the first way of controlling release is via the anterior pituitary by what's known as the parvicellular system. So this is made up of small neurons from the paraventricular and the arcuate nuclei in the hypothalamus. And these secrete either releasing or inhibiting hormones into the hypophysial portal vessels. So into the little group of blood vessels, which then carry these hormones to the anterior pituitary, where they then control the release of hormones um, from cells in the anterior pituitary, which then go into peripheral circulation. So just to clarify, the hormones that are released from the hypothalamus go into the um, the, port, the hypophysio vessels rather than systemic circulation and it's these portal vessels that take them to the anterior pituitary and then the anterior pituitary releases its hormones. So this is the, a really important table I think to learn. Um, again like I said before the nuclei on the left hand side are a general um, area rather than a hard and fast rule um, but this is a question that examiners love to come up with. Um, it will almost certainly be on your part A somewhere if you're an Oxford medic um, and so yeah I'm not going to talk you through the whole table um, because you can read it yourselves but just a few main points to highlight. So TRH, um, which controls the thyroid hormones, um, is released in response to things like cold and stress, um, since one of the roles of the thyroid is in increasing metabolic rate. And so obviously, if you're cold, that's something that needs to happen. 
CRH is corticotrophin releasing hormone, and this stimulates ACTH, adenocorticotrophic releasing um, adenocorticotrophic hormone secretion um, from the pituitary. And this has a diurnal rhythm. And so it peaks just before waking and then it's lowest at midnight, which means you get this diurnal rhythm with cortisol. So just before you wake up, you get this big pulse star release of cortisol and um, to prepare your body for being awake for the day. And then you don't really need that at night. So that's when it's lowest. Growth hormone um, is interesting because it has both direct effects on stimulating growth and reproduction, but also the hormone itself release it stimulates the release of the insulin-like growth factors from the kit uh, from the liver, um, and these have additional actions to stimulate growth. GnRH, so gonadotrophin releasing hormone, levels of this rise at the onset of puberty, and again this is pulsatile release. And it's one of the few exceptions to homeostasis. So when we often think about homeostasis, we think of a negative feedback system. So there's a change and then there's something that counters the change. But for GnRH, there's a certain point um, in the female reproductive cycle where this is not negative feedback, but positive feedback. And so at ovulation, what you get is you get a dominant follicle that releases a large amount of estrogen. And instead of inhibiting GnRH and LH release, as would normally happen, this big surge in estrogen actually causes a positive feedback mechanism, which then results in more and more GnRH and LH being released until you get what's known as an LH surge on day 14 of the menstrual cycle. And that results in the release of a follicle um, and ovulation. Um, and it's really interesting, um, the mechanism behind which this, there's a switch from negative feedback to positive feedback. Um, and if you're in Oxford, I definitely suggest taking the endocrinology molecule um, because you'll cover a lot of that next year. So that's one of our exceptions. Um, but the other one is uh, dopamine and prolactin. So as you'll have noticed, most of the other hormones, um, so GnRH, CRH, TRH, GHRH, they all stimulate the release of their pituitary hormone. But actually, dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin. Um, prolactin is important in stimulating production of milk and the growth of breast alveoli. And importantly, it also inhibits the reproductive access, axis. So you get a reduction in GnRH release and FSH and LH, um, and you get what's known as lactational amenorrhea. So you stop ovulating while you're breastfeeding. Um, and this is why breastfeeding can be protective against pregnancy in the first six months. So that's a summary of the anterior pituitary hormones, um, those main five released um, and the way that the hypothalamus controls them. Um, and so, like we said, that is released into the portal vessels to the pituitary and then to systemic circulation. The other way that the hypothalamus controls release from the pituitary is via the posterior pituitary. And this is slightly different. So this is not via the parvicellular, the small neurons that we talked about in the anterior pituitary, um, but the magnocellular neurons. So these neurons um, have their cell bodies in the hypothalamus, but their axons extend down into the posterior pituitary gland. And so the release of hormones here is directly into peripheral circulation rather than just into the portal vessels. So there are two hormones released by the posterior pituitary. Um, and again, they're made in the hypothalamus because that's where the cell bodies are, but they're carried by axonal transport into the posterior pituitary, which is where they're released from. So the first one is ADH, and this is important for maintaining osmolality. As we said earlier, the hypothalamus has inputs from the OVLT and the SFO, those circumventricular organs, um, which are outside the blood brain barrier. And neurons in these organs shrink in response to a reduction in osmolality because water leaves them, which causes gated iron discharge, gated iron channels to discharge and open, which then stimulates the hypothalamus to release ADH. The hypothalamus is incredibly sensitive to changes in osmolality. So something as little as a 1% change can result in ADH release. ADH is also released in response to other stimuli, such as a fall in blood pressure, but you need a proportionally greater change in blood pressure to simulate ADH release compared to the change needed in osmolality. 
ADH action is then on the collecting tubules of the kidney to stimulate water reabsorption um, via aquaporin insertion, um, and then this reduces osmolality. Its other action um, of ADH is vasoconstriction, uh, which is why the hormone is also known as vasopressin. So the other hormone released by the posterior pituitary is oxytocin. So this is important in social bonding and it's released on physical touch, hence it's known as the love hormone. Um, you've probably heard it a lot in relation to prairie bowls if you've had any lectures um, in Oxford. And you can understand that there's a lot of pharmaceutical interest in a hormone that can mimic love. But what you really need to know um, for physiology is that it's involved in two reflexes. Um, so the first of them is in childbirth, um, in what's known as, um, is it the Ferguson reflex? I can't remember if that's the milk one or the, the cervical one, um, but you can look that up. Um, but it's involved in childbirth um, where dilation of the cervix stimulates oxytocin release. And then oxytocin causes contraction of the uterus which increases the pressure um, and pushes the baby's head down into the cervix, causing further cervical dilation, more oxytocin release, until, as you can imagine, you get a positive feedback loop until eventually um, the baby is born. And it's also involved in the milk ejection reflex, um, and it stimulates letdown of milk into ducts. Um, so yeah, those are the two roles of oxytocin, um, primarily to do um, with childbirth and with breastfeeding. So that's the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary and what happens in normal physiology. But of course, you can have pituitary disorders. Um, they sometimes come up in exams, but also they're just really important for you to know as clinicians. So one of the very common conditions is a pituitary adenoma. Um, and these are tumours of the pituitary gland. But since they're adenomas, they're benign tumours. And while they're benign, they can have systemic effects because they can be functional tumours, which means they secrete hormones. And as you can imagine, secreting hormones means they'll have the effect of releasing a load of that hormone. The most common type of pituitary adenoma is a prolactinoma. And so this causes milk production in men or in women um, and infertility, as we talked about galactional, um, yeah, galactional amenorrhea earlier. If it causes production of growth hormone, it causes acromegaly, which you can see in the picture on the left is the spade like hands in the adults and a really prominent jaw. And the other one you'll hear about is Cushing's disease. And this is an ACTH producing tumour. And you can see in the picture on the bottom um, the different effects of that. So you get hypertension, you get muscle wasting, you get abdominal striae, you get a kind of moon shaped face is what is described. And so that's Cushing's disease when you get those symptoms caused by an adenoma. And it's important to distinguish this from Cushing's syndrome, which is where you have the same features, but not caused by a tumour. Um, you still have excess cortisol, but it's from another source. And most commonly, this is caused by doctors pre prescribing steroids, um, because steroids are really commonly used in clinical practice. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard a lot about dexamethasone um, and its use in COVID patients. So secondly, and this relates to our question earlier, um, no, it doesn't, not quite yet. Um, secondly, the increase in size um, can actually compress the rest of the pituitary gland. So you get a big tumour and then the rest of the normal pituitary cells atrophy, um, or you can get compression of the hypothalamic stalk. And so none of the hormones that stimulate release of the other pituitary hormones reach the pituitary. So you just get a global loss of function. So you might have a really well going prolactinoma and lots of milk secretion but actually your growth hormone isn't being released or your ACTH isn't being released. So you've got those effects as well. And then finally, and this is the one that relates to the question earlier, um, is the pituitary gland sits just below the optic chiasm. So if you get growth of the pituitary, it can compress the optic chiasm because it's in a very enclosed space and it can cause visual loss. And it's a specific type of visual loss called bitemporal hemianopia because you lose only your lateral fields of division, but in both eyes. And it's a good one to remember um, because not only does it come up in exams, but I also think it makes you sound quite clever. So big long thing, that's the endocrine system. So that's the first way that the hypothalamus controls the functions of the body and keeps homeostasis. The second way is via the autonomic nervous system. 
So to recap, this is the unconscious part of the nervous system, and it's made up of two parts. So you've got the sympathetic, fight and flight, or parasympathetic, rest and digest. They control all sorts of body functions like blood pressure, GI secretions, sweating, body temperature, etc. So this is it. They're organised slightly differently. So the sympathetic system originates in the thoracic and lumbar spinal cords. And you've got preganglionic fibres that go out from the spinal cords. They have ganglion in the sympathetic chain and they then synapse with postganglionic fibres or they can pass through without synapsing to other plexuses like the celiac or the superior mesenteric, and they then go to end organs. And then the parasympathetic is from the cervical and sacral spinal cords, and the preganglionic fibres pass directly to the viscera, and then postganglionic fibres are found near the viscera and are very short in comparison to the sympathetic where you've got long postganglionic fibres. So how does the hypothalamus control ANS function? So this shows how it relates to the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is primarily via three different nuclei in the brainstem. And then from here, axons of these nuclei travel to the target organs, synapse in the ganglia that are near or in the organ, and then innervate them. So the nucleus accumbens projects via the vagus nerve to the heart, the lungs and the pharynx. And so since this is the parasympathetic nervous system, so rest, it decreases the heart rate. It constricts the bronchioles um, and does other things that you'd expect um, when you're not in a kind of fight or flight response. The edinger westphal nucleus um, is in charge of the pupils. Um, so it travel with cranial nerve three and it works to constrict the pupils. And then the dorsal nucleus of the vagus. Um, so this has secretomotor fibres. Um, so this is where the rest and digest name comes in um, because it stimulates gastric secretion and motility. So that's parasympathetic and then the sympathetic nervous system. And this, again, is the fight or flight response. So like we've said, these have the cervical ganglion, the celiac and the mesenteric and the sympathetic ganglion. And these act to oppose the PNS. So you get the opposite of what we said on the previous slide. So pupil dilation, vasoconstriction, you inhibit your GI secretion and then things that will help with this fight or flight response. So an increase in heart rate, um, dilation of the bronchi and vasodilation of the muscle um, muscle vessels as opposed to vasoconstriction of the gastrointestinal vessels. So let's have a look at this um, in a specific example. Um, so I think you've done a bit on um, body temperature. And so we know that body temperature is normally kept at about 36 degrees. And we know from lesion studies um, that the two areas of the hypothalamus that are important in body temperature homeostasis are the preoptic area, um, because lesions here cause hypothermia, and the posterior hypothalamus, because lesions here cause hypothermia. So in this negative feedback model, there are cutaneous temperature receptors, which mostly give information about cold. And then there are temperature sensitive neurons in the pre-optic area, which primarily sense heat. And then this information from these two sources is integrated in the posterior hypothalamus. The posterior hypothalamus then activates the autonomic nervous system to induce heat dissipating or heat generating behaviors. So heat generating such as vasoconstriction, um, um, heat dissipating like sweating and vasodilation. And then in turn, this alters the body temperature, which is again detected by the receptors, which then signal to the posterior hypothalamus. And then when the deviation from set point has been corrected, this will turn off um, any homeostatic behaviours put in place. Um, so, yeah, you do get some exceptions in this, um, things like fever. You have a set point that's raised above normal because that's beneficial in the immune response. Um, but in general, as with most things in the body, the aim is to keep things at a constant homeostasis, internal, constant environment. But we know that that doesn't always happen. And so we're now going to look a little bit at the stress response. But first, if you want to hop on back over to Socrative, there's a couple more questions for us to answer. Answers are going quickly on this one. Well done, guys. I'm going to leave it a couple more seconds. 
I'm going to look at the question in the chat. Sorry, what's the room code for Socrative? Good question. Sorry, I'll put it in the chat. Um, it is Kanzo 676. Uh, 6760. There we go. Sorry, Hannah. Great. And 100% of you got that question right. I now think I've done the questions too easy, but at least it's a good boost for you guys. And then secondly, where are the temperature sensing neurons found in the hypothalamus? And I'm hoping I might catch some of you out on this one since you've all got pretty much 100% on the last few. Right, have a look. Yeah, okay, so the preoptic area is the right one. Those of you who put posterior completely understand that. The posterior is where the signals are integrated, but the actual temp uh, the neurons that can actually detect the temperature in terms of sense it directly are found in the preoptic area. Great, so leave that next one. We'll move on to the stress response now. So what is stress? do we need to ask that as students living in a pandemic? So I think the best definition of stress is the one put there. So a change that disturbs or even threatens to disturb the health balance. And as we know, there are lots of different types of stress. And I think there are kind of two important distinctions to make. So is the stress acute or chronic? So is it a short term thing that's gonna disappear quickly? Or is it a long term stress that's gonna result in a prolonged stress response? So things like extreme heat or cold dehydration, things that resolve quickly will trigger an acute stress response. And then chronic things, so chronic infection, malnutrition, phobias, chronic stressors, you know, pandemic life, um, that is things like chronic stress. And then the other thing which is really important is whether it's physical or psychological. So the classic things are the, um, the kind of evolutionary stress response has evolved is for physical stressors. So predators, we think of the fight or flight response, um, infections, toxins. But actually what we're seeing a lot more at the moment is psychological stressors, emotional and social problems. And we're going to think a little bit later about whether our classical stress response is appropriate for the kinds of chronic stressors um, that we're seeing in modern day life. So to touch briefly on the acute stress response, apologies, the slide is a bit busy. So the stress response is known as the fight or flight or the alarm response. Um, and it's mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, just as we talked about earlier. And since it's the sympathetic nervous system, the hypothalamus has a crucial role because it's got extensive control of that nervous system. And so it both activates the sympathetic and it inhibits the parasympathetic. So sensory centres in the cortex activate the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. And here there are several nuclei and it projects to the hypothalamus and different ones are activated. Um, and so the hypothalamus is a really good place to sense stress because it's got lots of different things that could sense a bodily stress, you know, a big change in temperature, extreme heat or cold, dehydration, ADH, you know. But um, it also is in good place to control the output of the stress response. So it does this again by the two main methods. So endocrine response. So you get release of ADH because like we said, dehydration could be a big cause for stress. So you want to um, massively increase the reabsorption of water and CRH because although we classically think of cortisol as part of the chronic stress response, you do also get some release in the acute stress response as well. And then obviously the main way is via the autonomic response. So you get projection to the medullary cardiovascular centers um, and also to other sympathetic fibers, where again, you get vasodilation of muscle ready for movement, constriction of the kidneys and splanchnic arterioles because you don't need all the blood flowing to your kidneys and your gut. And then you get sympathetic activation of the adrenal medulla. And so from the adrenal medulla, you get reduce of adrenaline, um, which further potentiates and prolongs all of the actions mentioned there. So that's the acute stress response, um, and it's mainly mediated by adrenergic receptors, which is why adrenaline is so important in potentiating and prolonging that. But you also get some CRH release, um, but this is more profound in the chronic stress response. 
And so since it's got a longer time frame and endocrine has a longer frame of action than the autonomic nervous system, the chronic stress response is mostly mediated um, by cortisol. So any type of physical or mental stress will increase the secretion of CRH, um, which in turn, as we've talked about, releases ACTH from the anterior pituitary, which then acts on the adrenal cortex um, in the zona fasciculata to release cortisol. And so normally, like with other things, this goes back to a negative feedback model. Um, so you get increase of cortisol, really decrease in CRH and ACTH, and then a potential decrease in cortisol again. But this is all disrupted in stress, because when you get a chronic stress, the thing that's triggering the cortisol doesn't go away. And so you get an excess cortisol secretion. And whilst ACTH levels will normally fall back to kind of basal levels, what we find is that the sensitivity of the adrenal cortex to ACTH increases. So you need a smaller release of ACTH for the same amount of cortisol secretion. And so the net effect of this combined with the chronic stressor is more and more cortisol being secreted in preparation for the stress response. So we've talked a lot about cortisol, but what actually does it do? So we've evolved this stress response mostly in response to physical stressors. So things like famine, predation. So cortisol mostly influences the physical functioning of the body. So metabolic, so it aims to preserve glucose for the brain, because as we know, glucose is the main fuel for the brain. And so it increases protein and lipid catabolism um, to produce more glucose for that. You get a dampening of the immune response. Um, so you get inhibition of the synthesis and release of cytokines. Um, and this is thought, though, kind of debated to be about preventing the body from mounting an autoimmune response under stress, which obviously wouldn't be beneficial. Um, but it's more complex than we originally thought, and cortisol can enhance some immune functions. Um, and yeah, more models of how cortisol alters the immune system um, are being developed all the time. It's quite an interesting area of research, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Um, so cardiovascular, um, so obviously one of the features of the stress response is a vasoconstriction. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine chronically you get hypertension um, because you have vasoconstriction over a very long period. You've got an increased afterload on the heart, increased force to pressure against. You can get hypertrophy. Um, so that's why you get lots of heart disease in um, chronic stressors. CS, um, so the hippocampus um, has a lot of cortisol receptors and long term exposure is known to disrupt memory and reduce synaptic plastic in the, as plasticity in the brain. And again, like the immune response, researchers aren't really sure why this is, um, because surely you'd want to consolidate memories of the stressor so that in future you could avoid the same stressor. So to disrupt memory would surely be counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, people aren't really sure. And again, lots of research is ongoing. Um, and then finally, the reproductive axis is suppressed in prolonged stress because becoming pregnant would obviously put a further drain on the body resources that you're trying to safeguard. So that's how the stress response is adapted to help us survive in a situation where there is a physical stressor. However, like we said, most modern day stressors are not physical, but psychological. So this stress response isn't actually appropriate. And as a result of this, we've seen a great rise in stress related disease in recent years and not just anxiety, the classic one, but these diseases, which, as you can see, are all related to the different as uh, different effects of cortisol on the body. So if you've got a chronic increase in glucose concentration to preserve it for the brain, you're going to get diabetes. If you've got infection, um, if you've got anti, if you're dampening down your immune system, you're going to get infections, heart disease, like we've said, depression, infertility. And it's really important for you to know about as medical students, because we, we prescribe a lot of steroids as clinicians. As we've said, we're using dexamethasone a lot at the moment in COVID patients, but they're also used to mature the lungs of preterm infants to prevent transplant infection, um, rejection and in inflammatory disorders. So things like asthma and arthritis. And whilst these are crucially important evidence proved medicines, actually the most common cause of Cushing disease, which is hypertension, poor wound healing, obesity, is use of exogenous steroids. 
So it's important that when we're prescribing these medications to weigh up the costs and the benefits and to explain these properly to patients um, because they don't come without their side effects. And again, we found that stress doesn't just affect the health of the person experiencing it, but in the case of pregnant women experiencing stress, the health of their fetus as well. This is known as the fetal origins of adult disease hypothesis, and it was first proposed by David Barker in the 1980s, who saw that mothers, um, the offspring of mothers who experienced malnutrition during pregnancy, gave birth to offspring with lower birth rates. And surprisingly, these then went on to have a higher incident of type 2 diabetes, obesity and metabolic disease than those born with a normal birth weight. And this is what's known as the thrifty genotype. So this adapts is an adaptation of the fetus to the maternal environment. So the increased amount of cortisol from the maternal stress of undernutrition signals to this fetus that it's going to be born into an adverse environment. So one that's really tough. And so it undergoes metabolic changes to prepare itself for this. And then when it's born and nutrition is in fine supply, these changes then predispose the baby to adult onset diseases associated with aberrant metabolism, so things like diabetes and obesity. And this has really important implications for public health initiatives because actually it suggests that the problem of obesity starts way before birth and we should be putting more resources into pregnant women and preventing ill health in adulthood rather than just focusing on later life interventions. Something that if you come to the reproduction lecture next week, we're gonna talk a little bit more about, um, but that's kind of the stress response in one. Um, so having talked a little bit about low birth weight, um, we're gonna have a quick segue through growth and metabolism. First, how by looking at how the fetus grows, then by looking at the determinants of postnatal growth, and then finally looking at the consequences of malnutrition. So firstly, prenatal growth. As we've already said, one of the really important and probably most important determinants of prenatal growth is substrate delivery from the mother. And this encompasses in itself a lot of different things. So maternal nutrition, how much the mother's eating, but also placental function. So is transport across the placenta working OK? Are there any factors altering it? So things like stress, smoking, hypertension, disease. So that all affects how much nutrition is transported from the mother to the fetus. And the other really important factor is hormonal control. And the hormones involved in prenatal growth are quite different from those involved in adult growth. Insulin-like growth factors are the important hormones of prenatal growth. These are produced mostly in the fetal liver and they're important for differentiation of most of the organs. They're also produced by the placenta and import are important in controlling the function of the placenta and partitioning nutrient transfer from mother to fetus. Insulin-like growth factors are in turn controlled by insulin levels. So you can see the flow diagram in the bottom. Transfer of glucose across the placenta causes release of insulin by the fetus, which then causes IGF release. And this is important when it comes to infants of diabetic mothers. So if the mothers have poorly controlled glucose control and then in turn have high glucose levels and then there's more transfer across the placenta, there's more insulin and IGF release by the fetus, which results in macrosomia, um, large birth weight. And as you can imagine, a large birth weight can cause complications and problems for women um, during birth and pregnancy. Um, and so it's really important for women to have well-controlled blood glucose um, during pregnancy if they have diabetes. And so like we've said, IGFs are important in prenatal growth, but in postnatal growth, it's growth hormone that has the dominant role. And we know this um, because children with growth hormone deficiency are a normal size at birth, so they're not a smaller size as you'd expect if it was important in, in prenatal growth. But by three to four years or so, they've fallen behind um, their peers in growth, um, which shows us that peak GRH levels um, are really important for the growth spurt. Growth hormone has both long term and short term effects. So in the short term, it alters metabolism by stimulating lipolysis and inhibiting peripheral glucose uptake. Um, so it's also known as diabetogenic as a hormone since it raises blood glucose. 
But as its name suggests, in the long term, it stimulates growth. Like we said earlier, it does this both directly by stimulating release of insulin-like growth factors. Um, no, it does this both directly through its action on bones and tissues and indirectly um, by stimulating release of insulin-like growth factors and things from the liver. The main IGF in the postnatal period, because there are two, IGF-1 and IGF-2, um, but the main one postnatally is IGF-1. Um, and this is really important for protein th synthesis. Um, and it also mimics the action of insulin because um, it's an insulin-like growth factor um, on the liver and adipose tissue. Um, you'd think that these are mostly important um, in the growth spur um, because obviously we stop growing at some point. Um, but actually, IGS and growth hormone continue to be secreted even into adult life um, when height stops increasing um, because they also have a really important role in increasing muscle mass, um, which is why so many bodybuilders are so keen to buy it over the Internet. I suppose the final thing to say is that, of course, there are other factors than growth hormone and IGF that are important in regulating height. Of course, there are other hormones involved. We've talked about the stress response and cortisol, um, because obviously, if you have high cortisol, you don't want to be gr and you know you've got a stress response and trying to preserve nutrients for the brain and vital organs. You're not going to be growing. So cortisol inhibits growth. Um, Things like genetics are important and the general rule of thumb is that children will reach the mid parental height. So the, the height between their mother and father um, and nutrition is also important, which we're going to look at slightly now. So when we think of malnutrition, um, which is an inadequate nutrition, nutritional intake, um, what we most commonly think of is a lack of food. Um, and you know, this isn't the most, the main one that we'll see as clinicians. Um, and we're gonna talk about obesity in a bit, but it's what our minds turn to first, I think. So let's talk a little bit about what happens to metabolism in the body over a fast. Generally, our bodies have enough stores of glycogen, so glucose, that can be released by glycogenolysis to glucose to supply us for about a 12 hour fast. Once this has happened, our glycogen stores are depleted. And this is where cortisol has a really important role in inducing metabolic changes that preserve glucose for the brain and shift metabolism for the rest of the body. So after 12 hours, you get an increase in proteolysis and lipolysis, and this provides substrates for hepatic gluconeogenesis, um, so increasing glucose production by the liver. You then get continuation of starvation, but then proteolysis starts to slow down because you've broken down all of the obvious muscle. There are fewer accessible um, stores, protein stores, and so you get an increase in lipolysis and alongside it ketogenesis, um, so production of ketone bodies, which as you might know, um, the brain can also use for fuel alongside glucose. However, eventually you're going to deplete all your fat stores as well, and all you're left are with the crucial life-sustaining muscles, things like the heart and the diaphragm. Um, and so at the end of a very severe fast, the body starts breaking these down, um, and this, is, this wasting of the muscles is eventually what leads to death from starvation. So to finish on that fairly grim point, um, if you want to hop back over um, to Socrative, there's a few more questions for us to go through um, before we get on to the last section of this lecture, which is on nutrient regulation. So where is adrenaline released from? I can see a few answers coming through. Yeah, you guys have got it. Give you a couple more seconds. I don't want to overrun. And as always, if there are any questions, just put them in the chat. Or if you want me to slow down or go back over something, I'm very happy to just listen to you guys. Yep, adrenal medulla, brilliant. Um, so where is so cortisol increases glycolysis in the liver? Ooh, OK, that was a close one. So. Cortisol 
its main aim is to preserve glucose for the brain. And so to do this, it wants to increase the blood concentration of glucose. So glycolysis would be reducing it because it would be increasing metabolism and promoting glucose use. Um, whereas glyco gluconeogenesis is what the liver actually does um, to increase glucose production by the liver so that there's more for the brain. Um, let me know if that needs more explanation. Um, I'm happy to go back over that. What is the most important hormone for prenatal growth? Brilliant insulin and IGF, I think Nat hammered that point home. Oh, okay, open answer one. There are many right answers to this one, but name a factor that determines adult height. And don't just think of the classic growth hormone because that will be the good ones coming in here. So what have we got? We've got stress, we've got genetics, mid parental height, good one, nutrition, growth hormone. GH secretion, nutritional, yep, someone's got all of them. Stress, really important one, yep, cortisol stunts growth. Nutrition during pregnancy, yep. Brilliant. Oh, and so we'll move on to appetite now before answering the last few questions. So we've talked about chronic starvation, which is one end of the spectrum of malnutrition. And now let's have a look at the other as we turn to appetite regulation. So this is the side of malnutrition that we're all going to come across far more often as clinicians. A third of the UK adult population is obese, which is defined as BMI of over 30. And this proportion is growing. Uh, we know that obesity is linked to increased risk of all sorts of diseases so hypertension heart disease infertility stroke diabetes cancer um and you know the prevalence of covid icu admissions um majority have got um lacking other comorbidities i have got a high bmi um so it's it's really important um that there are lots of public health interventions that are focusing on lifestyle changes and losing weight through diet and exercise but as we've seen with fetal programming, it's actually really important that we understand more of why people become obese in the first place so that we can prevent all of the sequelae associated. To get a better understanding of this, it's important to know that 45 to 85 percent of BMI is actually genetically determined. This comes from evolution and goes back to what we said at the start of the presentation about homeostasis. Maintaining energy stores in the form of adipose is really important for the body. Low levels of body fat would classically have increased the risk of starvation during a famine, and high levels of adipose would have increased the risk of predation for early humans. Which means that like with other forms of homeostasis, the body needs to have a signal to sense how much adipose tissue there is. The discovery of this signal came from some important experiments in mice. So. These are the um, D O B O B and the DB DB mice, um, and I'm sure you might have seen these before. So this was a really important set of parabiosis experiments done in 1973, where they discovered leptin. So mice with this O B O B mutation that were incredibly obese had been created in the 1950s, um, and then you've got the DB DB mice, which are diabetic mice. So these were parabios, so their circulations were joined together. And what they found was that the OB, OB mice starved and died, and there was no change in the DB mice. So from this, they inferred that the OB mice were lacking a soluble factor that signaled fat stores. And so when they were parabiosed, the DB mice had this factor. And so suddenly they um, were able to signal how much fat stores they were. And so their weight reduced, whereas the DB mice were lacking the receptor. And so this eventually led to the discovery of leptin and its receptor. And oh, I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, leptin signals to the hypothalamus. So leptin receptors are found on two populations of neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, the POMSI cart and the AGRP MPY neurons. These both act on the same MC4R receptors in the paraventricular nucleus and have opposing actions. So the POMSI cart neurons signal satiety. So leptin, since it, it signals adequate fat stores, 
stimulates the POMC cart neurons, which in turn stimulate the paraventricular nucleus, which then results in increased metabolism since you've got sufficient fat stores and decreased feeding. And then the opposite is true for AGPR, AGRP and PY, it's quite a mouthful. Um, these are inhibited by leptin. And so when we're lacking in leptin stores, they're, leptin stores, they're active, inhibit the PVRN and increase feeding. There's also, importantly, an additional pathway between POMC cart neurons and AGRPY, where AGRP neurons can inhibit POMC neurons via GABAergic projections, um, which is how we can override a sense of satiety and keep eating even when we're feeling full. And so the paraventricular and the arcuate nucleus are two really important ones in appetite control. Um, but of course, it's not just those two that are important in appetite regulation. That would be far too easy for us to learn as students. Uh, there are lots of other different projections, um, but the two that are really important to know um, and to just learn as facts are that the lateral hypothalamic area is the feeding centre. Um, yeah, the feeding centre and the ventromedial nucleus is the satiety centre which is why there's a picture of Winnie the Pooh looking very full. And um, this is known again through some lesional studies um, where they lesioned these different areas and saw the effects on different mice. So leptin is important in mediate, mediating feeding and metabolism, but leptin levels stay constant um, with body fat. They don't change as and when we eat. So what stimulates feeding on a meal to meal basis? I like to think there are three categories, hormones, nutrients and neurons. So hormones, you've got insulin first, um, which acts in a similar way to leptin in that it stimulates pomsi car and satiety. You've then got gastric hormones, so CTK, um, pancreatic polypeptide, um, glucose like peptide one. And these are all released in response to feeding. And so since they're released in response to feeding, they act to decrease food intake. They all have slightly different stimuli and act via slightly different mechanisms. Um, so, for example, CCK is released in particularly in response to a fatty meal and it acts via the vagus nerve, whereas GLP-1 is an incretin, so increases insulin secretion. But they all have the same effect to increase satiety. And importantly, in that column, ghrelin is the only hormone that stimulates um, feeding. So it stimulates the AGRP neurons and stimulates, drives us to eat. Um, and that's what is known as the hunger hormone. The second column, you've got nutrients. Um, so obviously, presence of nutrients signals food intake. Um, so it's going to act to oppose that and to increase metabolism. There are different ways of sensing each of them. Um, so, for example, there are glucose excited and glucose inhibited neurons. Um, amino acids are also really important, and particularly those essential amino acids that we can only get from dietary intake. And then in the third column, you've got neurons. Um, so, of course, nutrients and hormones are sensed by different neurons. Um, but the vagus nerve also detects gastric distension, so mechanical feeding, um, gastric distension that stimulates the vagus nerve, um, which then decreases food intake. So those are all the physiological reasons um, in which we eat. But we know that that's not the only or even the main reason that we eat. We eat when we see food we like, we eat when we're stressed, when we're upset, when we're around other people eating. And so this involves slightly different areas of the brain to just those kind of core physiological um, stimulus stimulated areas. So firstly, you've got the orbitofrontal cortex, and this has secondary taste and olfactory cortices. And from taste and smell, it builds up a picture of flavour of food, uh, which obviously is important in our desire to eat. And then you've got the ventral tegmental area, um, which, as you'll know, is a source of dopamine. It has leptin receptors. So um, when with full um, it, dopamine releases decrease so eating doesn't give us as much satisfaction and it also has ghrelin receptors so food tastes better when we're hungry so our desire to eat is increased when we need to these then both um, project to the lateral hypothalamic area um, which as we've said is the feeding center and this in turn activates agrpy and feeding so let's bring this all back to obesity it's a bit of a whistle top tour. I'm sorry, please do go back over the slides um, for the diagrams. If we have so many signals, nutrients, hormones, neurons, 
that tell us when to eat and when not to eat. Why do people still become obese? Well, the fact that physiology isn't the only important factor in whether we eat or not um, is important. You know, people will keep eating if there's loads of cake in front of them. But it's also to do with what happens when our body is faced with too much of a signal. So when leptin levels are high, what we get is leptin resistance. The body down regulates leptin receptors and decreases transport across the blood brain barrier, meaning that the body perceives starvation because it's got less leptin signals in the face of plenty. In response, you get less stimulation of POMC cart and more um, less inhibition of AGRPY. So you get more feeding. So body fat increases and leptin further increases, which further down regulates leptin receptors. And you get this chronic cycle. And um, whilst OB, OB mice lost weight with leptin, treatment of obese patients with leptin doesn't cure them because they have this chronic down regulation of leptin receptors and leptin transports. So what do we do about this? And that's the million dollar question and hopefully the one that you'll all be wanting to answer um, as physicians. I've put a little picture in the corner. Um, I don't know if you know what a gastric bypass looks like, um, but this is currently the most effective treatment um, for weight loss. So food literally bypasses the stomach and goes straight into the jejunum or the duodenum. And I think it's really interesting to think about why this is effective. So one of the reasons is that yes, the stomach can physically hold less food. So you feel full quicker, you can take in less food. But I think another one comes back to our control of appetite. Since food passes straight into the small intestine, you get a much larger release of glucose, um, of GLP-1, so glucose-like peptide. And we know, like we said earlier, this is an important hormone in inducing satiety. So it stimulates pomsi cart neurons and stimulates insulin secretion. Could it be that this increase in GLP-1 be what causes patients to lose weight and to keep it off in when you get a gastric bypass? unlike with conventional weight loss and dieting. It's probably not the only reason, but it certainly has an important role. And it's gonna be something that I'm sure is studied a lot more um, because it's our most effective treatment for weight loss at the moment. So it's eight o'clock. There are three more questions to do on um, Socrative. So if you wanna hop back on over and we'll do the last three. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat um, because this is the end of the lecture now. And I'll put the slide for feedback on once we've done the last few questions. So which of these hormones stimulates appetite? Hopefully this will be an easy one. Yeah, ghrelin, perfect. Ooh, this, this one we did not cover, but is interesting. Um, do you know which type of fat is more strongly associated with metabolic disease? So you've got fat that's kind of around your organs, um, so the kind of visceral fat, and then you've got subcutaneous fat, so fat just under your skin. What do we think? Yeah, well done, 79% of you, it is your visceral fat. So fat most around your organs, so you think of fatty liver, fatty heart, that is what causes disease rather than the subcutaneous fat, um, which is more associated with kind of thermoregulation um, and keeping you warm. Then last question, which of these is the feeding centre? This is one of these that you just have to know. Oh, answers coming in nice and quickly. Give it a couple more seconds. Brilliant, lateral hypothalamic area. That is the feeding center. So thank you so much um, for all paying attention. Um, I suppose the two main themes running through all of this are the hypothalamus and the home and homeostasis. Um, the body doesn't like change, just like me, and tries hard um, to keep things the way they are. Um, of course, we talked a little bit about when change does need to happen. So things like growth, um, positive feedback loops in childhood, in childbirth and ovulation. Um, and what happens when this goes wrong in stress and obesity. So that's it. Um, the feedback form um, will give you a link to getting the slides. Um, I hope this has been really useful. Um, please do be absolutely honest in your feedback. Um, I'm giving a lecture on reproduction next week um, and would love to see you there, but would also love to know how to improve presentation um, for the people who will be coming to that. So great, you guys are free to go and I hope you really enjoy your evenings. I'll stay on.